This week on Media Delta, Pat Labor, the movie. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Media Delta. Um, we are taking a look at actually uh, another rendition of a franchise that we have actually taken a look at before. Um, a long, t- well, I don't know how long time ago, but a while ago, uh, we actually took a look at a series of OVAs uh, for the Pat Labor franchise uh, back in episode 14. Uh, and this time, uh, we are taking a look at another Pat Labor uh, kind of media. Uh, this time, we are taking a look at Pat, uh, Pat Labor. The mo- God, every I know it, I keep on wanting to say Pat Labor, but it's Pat Labor, and it annoys me every single time. But yes, we're we are talking about Pat Labor the movie today, um, which is by by um, it's mostly by the same people. Uh, animated by Studio Dean. Uh, still got Mamoru Oshii as director. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, it is in the same timeline uh, because Pat Labor, if you're talking about the animated stuff, has generally two cons- two timelines, so to speak. Uh, and this is the second in the movie slash OVA timeline, you know, because at least that timeline makes, or naming makes sense. So, um if you're not familiar with what Pat Labor is, uh, it is basically a, a I don't want to say a show, but it's a uh, series that is about a um, police unit in Japan that uh, is involved, or basically their, I don't want to say their gimmick, uh, but their speciality is that they use labors to do their work. Now, labors are essentially mechs. Um, they are more... I would say realistic, quote unquote, mechs than say something like say a Gundam, but uh, they are mechs nonetheless, um, and they uh, usually try and solve crimes that involve other labors, which usually like construction or military of, or something of the ilk. Well, those are um, two kinds of labors. Yes, you're right. I mean, they're I think because what it's con- I think that yeah that it, what it's the police ones the military it's the heavy one. machinery basically yeah. Yeah, it's basically, yes, they are essentially heavy machinery. Well, not essentially, they are heavy machinery. We don't have gladiatorial combat yet. Yes. Um, so, I was not the only one who watched this, so please introduce yourselves to other people who watch this. Hi, this is Carnival, and this makes up the question. What are the, well, I know this is Japan, but what do you think Miranda writes would be considering, considering use of labors? I don't know. I mean, it's it's basically if you stole a fucking dump truck. Maybe your bumper stickers are admissible in a court of law. All right, sure. Uh, I, I'm Chachi. Um, this is this is the only Pat Labor content I'm really familiar with. Uh, I, I I'm here largely for the labors. Um, like probably eighty percent plus ten percent. <laughs> I'm Torpid Typist, and I'm here to discuss complex themes on rapid construction and land development and what that does to people. Yes. Um, This is an interesting, like, the thing with Pat Labor that I always find kind of interesting is the fact that, uh, like, it has a really weird tone to it. Like, it is... Sometimes trying to be like very introspective and sometimes also incredibly goofy, uh, which is actually, um, if you're familiar with Mamoru Oshii's work at large, uh, he actually, like his older stuff tends to be like that. Uh, If you've ever seen any of his live action movies like The Red Spectacles or Stray Dogs, you will realize that they are very dark movies that also have really weirdly comedic uh, segments, um, but are still like very like... Um, I don't want to say topical, but they are they have a message with them. Uh, and Pat Labor is very much that kind of thing. Uh, we've taken a look at, well, we took a look at Pat Labor in the early days, which kind of had a weird mix of that. Sometimes the, it was more comedic than, you know, serious um, because just to the episode. Then there was a military coup. Then there was a military coup. We also watched uh, Ghost in the Shell, which is almost entirely serious um, with very, very few comedic segments in that. Um, but uh, yeah, this one is tends to be more like his older stuff. Um, 
which is part of the thing that I like about Pat Labor. Like, it has a really neat tone to it. Um, but yeah, I guess before uh, we kind of get more into more in-depth discussion, we should probably just kind of go through and uh, kind of say what we felt about it. So, uh, Carnival, uh, what did what did you think of Pat Labor the movie? I like this much more than the OVA, just because I enjoyed much more of a focus. Here is the larger plot thread that we have going through. And it, I felt it much more tonally consistent than the OVA, which that's just, this is a movie versus an OVA of different episodes. But overall, it's still very good. Well thought out of how we have giant robots that exist as basically power vehicles and how the implications of this would work in terms of law, corporate espionage, and other chicanery. All right. Um... Is that it? Yep, that's it. All right, Chachi. Um, the thing I quite liked about Pat Labor, the movie, is that even as a newcomer to the franchise, you got a pretty strong cross-section of what the world looks like. Not in an extreme level of depth. You don't know who invented the labor when you know you know when they first discovered like how to create power cells that had a power to rate ratio yak 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 all that stuff but it does give you it does give you sort of an an idea of the interconnectedness of the of the world in that regard that you sometimes find when you're in a profession that uses heavy machinery like um, if you're in manufacturing or something, you tend to start to hear a lot of the same names um, and you start to move in circles that have like volatile alumni who will be working with you and then they'll go to a different company and you won't hear from them for a while. And then all of a sudden you bump into them again on a completely unrelated project. Um, so in that respect, it felt quite grounded. And... Um, I, and I, I really appreciated that. It made the narrative, which to be fair, was a little bit hard for me to follow at times. It made the narrative feel a little bit more grounded, even though um, it was it was a bit gonzo. Like there was there was clearly the the the, the, the mental contortions of a crazy person at work. Um, but it felt sort of semi believably insane. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that that is one thing I like about Pat Labor is the more groundedness to it. Like, I really I like a a real robot thing. Like, I I don't have anything. I don't like have anything against things like Gundam. But there's something I really appreciate about a real robot thing where they're trying to like have the th have the mechs be semi realistic, because of course they're mechs, so they're not like realistic, so to speak. But they are they're trying. Um. It's why I like things like uh, it, it. It's the thing why I really liked games like Chrome Hounds or like um, Armored Core does kind of go into the super robot kind of thing, but it's still kind of more grounded in the sense. I mean, I would consider Armored Core about the same level of groundedness as Gundam on average, or at least yeah. Universal Century Universal Century Gundam. It at least the other ones we take and give as as time progresses I, I don't want to steal too much air for for the conversation but i think i think one thing that helps draw a line of distinction between super robot and real robot is a lot of the time um i feel like real robot media has the has has the heavy machinery exist as part of the world rather than having the world sort of exist to justify the giant robots. That makes sense. Cause again, Tomino when doing Gundam is like here, we're going to make up this particle that gives everything else. All right, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. It's actually funny. Cause I was I actually looked up real, like I looked up real robot, which is it's, it's kind of funny. Cause usually the two terms are super robot and real robot. Uh, and it's it's actually kind of funny. Um, uh, the fact that uh, Mobile Suit Gundam 1979 is largely considered to be the first series to introduce the real robot concept, which 
interesting. Um, but yeah, like you also got stuff like apparently, uh, um, it's also apparently our armor troop. I, I, this is up for, um, I don't know how we do it, but th it is something that is up for, uh, me as at some point, uh, armor troop or Votoms. Yeah, so, I've heard that's always it, been good. I, I can't remember. The problem is I've only seen the only bits of that I've seen is just the one, the head dudes just killing a bunch of people. But I haven't actually seen the robots in it, so I can't really, like, say. I mean, the distinction between real robot and super robot is just straight up one of uh, ridiculousness. That's that's it. You got your super robots, which are borderline magic, and then you got your real robots, which aren't. That is true. They can um, have some magical particle, but they at least try to ground them in some fashion. Uh, for context, um, the... The sort of iconic uh, vehicle from Armor Trooper Votoms, the Scope Dog, is uh, is basically it's just big enough to house the pilot in the torso. So they're probably like three, four meters, maybe. Mm. But yeah, Super Robot would be something like Gurren Lagan, that kind of deal. Go Lion. Yep. Oh yeah. <laughs> Especially any of those those really cla like just classic giant robots. Mazinger, yeah. get a robot. Yep. Mazinger. Any of that stuff. That that's super robot. That is specifically super robot. There's your just that is the distinction. It's it's a lot fuzzier than you'd think. Yeah, I'm not. I I should say uh, with like that I'm not. Robot stuff in general is not usually the anime that I tend to watch, but it is something that I've kind of observed from a distance. So. Um, yeah, at least I have I have some experience, I guess. Um, also, also, yeah, I guess I guess Macross also technically counts as at least here as real, real robot, which kind of makes me realize that apparently real robot did not mean what I thought it meant. Yeah, nope. it, it, Macross is one of those ones that is sort of a gradient from real robot to super robot, depending on which particular series you're watching. And even then, it sort of varies in from episode to episode. Sometimes, yeah, I, I, I kind of need to. I kind of want to sit down and watch like actual Macross. Not not so much Robotrek, but a Robot. I keep wanting to say Robotrek, which is a completely different thing altogether. But uh, not Robotech, but Macross. But yeah, uh, did you have any other uh, thoughts about it? No, no. All right, uh, Torbo. Uh. <clears throat> I I enjoyed it. I think it's good. Yay. Uh, but no. So a thing about Pat Lover, but especially this in particular that I've, I enjoy is just, um, it's it's not just about the robots. Yes, the robots play a large part, but it's not just about them. Uh, including in this, where one of the big things they tackle, in terms of the story, just doesn't even have to do with the robots, which is the rapid redevelopment and deconstruction of Tokyo over the years, over and over. And what that meant for people uh, on the outside, basically. And so it, it it's willing to tackle these things while also, yeah, there are robots. Uh, they only really particularly use the robots at the end, though. Yeah, and like, there, there's like a handful of, like, uh, there's a handful of, ro uh, like, robot usage, like at the beginning, there's a uh, construction robot that goes loose. Yeah, to establish what labor like what labors are and labor crime yeah but essentially they're they're just a background for the main plot which is almost entirely uh based on the people that are involved yeah not the yeah. not the robots themselves the series I, is a police procedural at its heart yeah uh i also will say a big thing is too is that the only actual mechs that care about aesthetics are specifically the the police ones uh, the the actual uh, ones used for construction look a lot more utilitarian, and that's kind of a big thing, because I think it's actually in the the OVA where they specify, yeah, it, it focuses on aesthetics as well, so people are less intimidated by it. Uh, that sounds like something that'd be in the OVA, yeah. Kind of important, yeah. But in in general, I, I think it's a lot of fun. It, it tackles some complex themes, even though sometimes they go over people's heads, uh, including with how the villain works out. Which was great at the end, having people like, wait, where was the villain? What was, what was his reason? Because it handled them with a, a lot more subtlety and delicacy than you would kind of expect of this sort of thing. 
Yeah, for better or worse. Even if the main plot was fucking robots wreaking havoc because whistling wind through building makes sensor go vroom. I love Condemned 2. <laughs> <laughs> Look, stupider plots have happened in real life. They have. I suppose. But, but it's, it's just, it's, it's amusing. Because basically the entire thing is uh, they've been having these construction uh, labors and it's really all labors are, or con- are construction or, or war, one of the two, uh, have been going out, letting loose, and going berserk, uh, but also while completely unpiloted. And so the entire movie is about trying to figure out who's doing it and trying to stop it uh, before it, it actually uh, gets out of hand, which, right, spoilers, they stop it, but they cause a lot of destruction and progress because that is literally every fucking pat labor. It's, yeah. it's not pat labor if they don't destroy almost as much as they save. I mean, the cops. True. Uh, but they're also incredibly underfunded. Yes. Because uh, that's kind of a big thing about the, the unit, too, is that they are understaffed and underfunded constantly because they're such a niche unit. Uh, which is why their leader has to, the, the head of the, the division has to be a sly son of a bitch to get his way. Yeah. Goto is such a really... It's... Goto might actually be one of my favorite characters in all of anime. Actually. He's, he's like, Loki. Like, it, I, I, it, he's got a good face. Like, he always has a very, like... I, it's hard to describe, but there is something about his character that is very endearing in a very shitty kind of way. The deadpan helps. Yes. He's very, yeah, he's very down to earth, but very deadpan in the way he delivers things, while also being a person who will pretty much do and use whoever he can to get what he needs, for better or worse. Uh, but yeah, so it's, it's, it's mostly about the squad uh, and what they do. Uh, there is, weirdly enough, though, two detectives that they show repeatedly which exists pretty much solely to give you insight on the villain's background and not much else. Uh, but they also help to to sort of um, establish the environment that, that everything is taking place in. Because, like, for the most part, with the main characters, you see the city, and, and that's about it. Or you learn about the fucking, uh, fucking ocean development they're doing and the, the, the mega city they're building on it, essentially. But then you see these guys going through these old abandoned buildings left in areas that were left undeveloped or just completely forgotten. And it's just kind of interesting seeing all of that too. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I think I think it's a good movie. Yeah. Um, go on. Oh, I was just going to go on to my thing. Uh, what were you going to say? I was going to say, yeah, it, sometimes it's a little bit uh, obtuse for, 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 some, for some people because like you go into these sorts of things with a certain expectation. This tries to do a little bit more with it, but yeah, in general, I really enjoy it. Uh, yes. Um, so I also really enjoy this movie, namely because I am a I. Mamoru Oshii is probably one of my favorite anime directors. Um, probably one of my favorite Japanese directors, which I take with like an asterisk because I'm not super familiar with Japanese cinema. Um, but from what is the stuff that I've seen, I am pretty interested. Um, also, I looking at the Wikipedia page, there are some things about this movie that I did not realize that um, it's actually making me more angry because uh, this is making me realize some things that were apparently a thing that never happened because they got canceled. Um one of the things about this movie that's kind of weird is that there is a ton of biblical passages. Um, apparently that came about because Oshi realized that, oh, we have a character named Noah Izumi. So, oh, Noah, like biblical Noah. Let's just do some biblical references. <laughs> um, also, the, I, also uh, the entire thing with there being a Tower of Babel bit came about because apparently Mamoru Oshii was working on a loop on the third movie involving the Tower of Babel. Good. Which I would have loved to see a Mamoru Oshii loop on the third movie, because that would have been really weird. Um, 
and yeah, some of that stuff came just from that movie or that uh, idea for a movie that never happened. Um, and then, like, apparently there was other stuff from that canceled movie that they were going to use in this movie, uh, but they instead used in one of the live action movies for this. Um, which, again, I just <laughs> I always love it when that it's like, oh, we're just going to put something in this just because, oh, we couldn't do it in this one thing. So we're just going to use it in this uh, this other thing. Um, but yeah, um, I I do like pet like. Of the things that Oshi has done, uh, I think Pet Labor is the one that I can definitely go back to uh, repeatedly because it is, I say, it's the most quote unquote light, lighthearted of the stuff that he's done because a lot of his other stuff is very heavy. Uh, stuff like, you know, his Care Bro stuff, like, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Stray Dogs, Red Spectacles, uh, also Jinro the Wolf Brigade, if you are familiar with that movie. God, and yes. God. another movie that he did uh, that is part of that Care Bro. Uh, a very good movie. Also, not one you probably want to watch repeatedly, but still. Whoa. Um, a very similar kind of thing to Pat Labor, but a much darker take on it. It's um, very cynical, actually. Yes. Um. But this is this has a very nice tone to it. And and like I just really like this franchise as a whole. Um and this movie is a very good way of getting into it. Uh because like Chachi said, uh it is it explains just in like there are some things in this movie that I felt if you are not familiar with Pat Labor as a whole, you will kind of get confused. Or you might you might get confused. Um, for example, the character, I forgot what his name is, um, uh, but the, the one in the squad that's married, um, his mention of the wife that, that his, him mentioning the wife might be a little weird if you're not familiar with that's kind of his gimmick. Um, also, uh, the big guy, you don't really see a whole lot of him outside of the tomato garden. And then him also, uh, shooting a lot of things with the anti-material rifle. Cause he's the only one big enough to use it. I mean, also there's, I forget, is it? Uh, I forget her name, but our f- friend from the NYPD showing up like in the last third of yeah. the movie is also you, something that's like, if you didn't see the OVA, this is going to come out of nowhere. Yeah, because Kanuka herself, uh, Kanuka Clancy, um, doesn't show up like she was only in, I believe, half of the OVA and she doesn't show up in a lot of like I think in the TV show, she's only in like in less than half of the series as a whole. Um, but I guess they brought her back because she is she is really good. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, like it, it's just I don't really have a whole lot to say about this movie, but it's just a really good movie. Why are you in Japan? What is your reason for staying? Combat. Yes. <laughs> so good. No, she's great. I just kind of wish she got a bit more screen time, actually. Yeah. Um, In general, like, it feels weird that, like, Noah, of all people, didn't get as much screen time, considering she's basically the main character. I, so, it's really, really, there's two main characters. Uh, You got Noah, and you also have uh, Asma, who, I guess, with the plot of the movie, it makes sense why they focus on him, you know, him being the son of the uh, head of the company that is... That basically is the reason why all this stuff is happening. Um, so it makes sense for him to be kind of the more of the focus. Uh, but we do see a good bit of Noah uh, more so than the really others. I don't like him as much as a character. <laughs> yeah, Asma is kind of not that great of a character, um, but he's kind of the. Uh, I feel like he's also the um, viewer stand-in, so to speak. Yeah. Which. Yeah. He's yeah. Bland. He's very bland. Yeah, this is, this is where my lack of context regarding Pat Labor causes me to throw a gear a little bit because with, with with the roles as we saw them in the film, it does seem almost like for some reason the I don't want to say stereotypical because I don't know the character that well, but kind of the stereotypical protagonist girl. She's got red hair. She's into the giant robot. She's rough and tumble and all that stuff is sidelined in favor of somebody who within the first couple of minutes seems to be established as kind of her snotty know-it-all programmer friend. 
um, which is which is very much like this is this is the person who's her foil and like the second banana. Why why are we focusing on him? And it, it gels after a little bit, um, but it did definitely sort of make me wonder at points like well, does, this guy doesn't really seem like a principal character in some ways. So in most of the other things, Asma is pretty big. Uh, usually it tends to focus on Noah because Noah's the more interesting character. Um, but Asma does get a pretty big role in a lot of the other things. Because um, like he is like, I think he's like one of the first people you see in the OVA. Yeah, he is. Uh, well, because basically it pretty firmly establishes that like him and Noah are the main characters. Even though Noah was always a bit more at the forefront. Um, yeah, and then... his design boring. Asma, of that group, he is the worst. I'd say the worst because it's just... He, the least interesting, I guess. He's the least interesting. Better. I would say the worst is uh, Oda, who is just the... he. Oda just has one gimmick, and it is he wants to shoot everything with the big, big robot giant shotgun. And he oh. always eats shit. Always eats shit. Oh, the police brutality guy. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. police brutality. Like, you see, you'd say that as a joke, but that's actually kind of his thing. Yeah, is that's that his he? Is that he tends to break shit? Um, which actually kind of reminds me because I'm looking at it right now. Uh, one thing that I did find kind of funny about this movie, like it's not bad, but it's just kind of funny, is the casting on this movie. Um. Because, like, it, no one really does a bad job in here. The voices are all good, worked. Uh, we watched the uh, English version of this. Uh, it should specify the Bandai, the Bandai dub, um, not the original manga UK dub, um, which I none of these names kind of sound familiar. Um, uh, but you do have some uh, big names in here or like names that i at least recognize like ota's voice for the reason that i re realized it, ota being voiced by sam regal uh you have jameson price you have uh liam o'brien i believe that name sounds familiar lou julian taylor doug uh Airholes. uh but the one that really throws me off is goto's voice cast uh who is goto being voiced by roger craig smith yeah, it's it feels weird. Yeah, it's just like a little bit too young sounding. Like you could almost kind of hear. It's weird hearing Goto with the almost kind of Sonic voice. Like he, 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 uh, he, I think he, you mean Chris Redfield. Yeah, he's doing the Chris Redfield, but you almost kind of hear the Sonic in it a little bit too. But even the Chris I Redfield mean, is you way too young from Apex. Yes. Which Mirage from Apex is essentially the Sonic voice, isn't it? Yeah, uh, it pretty much is. A little lower pitch, but yes. But yeah, that's that's just one thing I found funny about this. Also, Yuri Lowenfall plays an incredibly bit part. He does, but you still know his voice the second you hear it. Because it's one voice. He only does yeah. one voice. One voice only. A man of many voice. Yeah. Um, yeah, also... Uh, <laughs> Looking at it, um, I got. I wonder if this is that has to be intent. I gotta look something up real quick. Actually, um, do do do. Um, yeah. Apparently, I don't know if the character was like this is a pat. This is actually a pat labor consistency because I was looking at the Japanese list. Uh, there's actually a relatively big. Like I say, big name because he's kind of well known over here. Um. But Shigeru Chiba voices uh, the old mechanic who is on vacation. What a shock. During this. Uh, and his name is, in Pat Labor, the character's name is Shigeo Shiba. So I'm wondering if they named, did they get incredibly lucky and get him as the voice actor, or did they just name, get the voice actor and then just named him that? That's always found it funny. We we've seen stuff like that before in in japanese media they like to do little nods and goofs like that all the time i'm thinking specifically back to when they had uh reiko chiba play herself in the fatal fury movie huh two minutes you're right god i had to think about it but you're right your 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 hypothesis would not surprise me yeah i just always i i just thought that was funny um 
Other than that, uh, I don't really have anything else to add. Does anyone else have anything to add? No. I'm going to confess that I, I, I picked up on a decent amount of the stuff in the film thematically, but um, I'm going to out myself as being just a little bit too peanut brained to figure out exactly what the significance of the tomatoes were. I, I mean, I sort of grant that they were like a symbol of, hey, you know, this is this is like a, a chance to have a taste of world outside of work and you're getting, you know, essential minerals and having fresh produce and that's really nice. But like the way they kept sort of coming back to individual tomatoes as something that helped what's his face pick, figure out part of the conspiracy, I it it went by me a little bit. You see, they really liked the big O. <laughs> um, yes, they had I... future site technology to see something that wouldn't be produced for another what twenty years. Um, not that much. Yeah, because what was Big O, like, 99? I don't remember, actually. Oh, Big O was, like, 99, but... We're reading far too much into a joke. Yeah. Um... Back off, everybody! Back <laughs> off! Uh, I, 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 his giant revolver. I, I will also admit, I kind of didn't get that either. Um, I, I think they may have just used it to tie things together more than anything, but that could just be me. The problem is I, did, I couldn't figure out what the tie was. But the, the tomato, just having the tomatoes of always being there, just a recurring element, not necessarily deep symbolism. Possibly. Ah, uh, I've been bamboozled. Uh, I see. We finally hit the point of where we've crossed over into the other side of film criticism, where we're seeing things that aren't there. You see, like <laughs> the herring, the tomato is also red. <laughs> the tomato, like communism, was red herring. Ha. Huh. I mean... I, I will say that, yeah, like, I can understand, like, not catching all of it. Like, once again, I, I distinctly remember from when we were watching, someone straight up asked, so wait, what was the whole point of the villain? What were they doing? Yeah, um, they, they don't, because it's also great because the end of this movie is basically them, like, after the, just immediately after the destruction of the Ark thing. Uh, and there's no, like, like, oh, after this happened, this happened. So it just kind of ends. Yeah. Also, you never see the villain. Yeah. Because it's it's out it's implied never outright. You never like see the body or anything, but basically the the villain kills himself like right like a couple days before the events of this movie happen. I thought they already told us that he committed suicide. They never found the body, so I was kind of expecting it to be like, oh, I am hidden. Like I was expecting that end bit to be that he would he has been hiding out in the ark all this time, but he, he wasn't. Then they trash it anyway, so it didn't matter. Yep. I've been stealing from the vending machines and crapping in a sock. <laughs> Finally. Also, also to be fair. Go ahead. Let's just say another thing that kind of was kind of confusing to me was, um, I think it was Osmo who came up with this that was like. Oh, the the programmer's name is Ehoba, like Jehovah. Yeah, yup, yup, it was him, and it was really a bizarre reach. <laughs> like, that, that is a very long stretch. I love Black Dynamite. Yeah, so going going back to what you, you had said before about uh, the, the, the quotes, the Bible quotes and all that, it's it's important to note that nobody actually quotes the Bible except for the villain who does in these cryptic messages. Also, babble, 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 babble. Yes. Uh, which, you see, the Tower of Babel is the giant tower they were constructing. It's symbolic. Uh-huh. But they called it Project Babylon, so... Which, again, there's, like, that thing of, like, please, there are some names you should just shouldn't use because you're invoking things you don't want yeah. I, the most well, believable thing about that, if we're going to that, is just the fact that the entire plot happens because this fucking company doesn't want to admit there's a fault with their sweet new OS that they're rolling out. Uh, so instead, bad things just keep happening, uh, and they just blame it on pilot error. Yep. Uh, it's, it's, it's very good, though. Uh, you, you never meet the villain... The villain never says anything directly to the cast. It's just the Bible quotes that you see in the programs and all that. 
because uh, essentially, yeah, the 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 villain was was never in the movie to begin with in any yep. capacity. <laughs> they were dead. Um, and everything that was just part of a plan because essentially, uh, there there the, there are two things that that go on that kind of help you figure out more about uh the the villain, which is obviously the the programming stuff. Uh, but there's also, uh, as I said before, uh, there's always these these bits like peppered in here and there, uh, of of these two detectives going through all these old buildings trying to figure out what's going on, uh, and you learn that they are basically looking for the villain and try to figure out what his his motive was, and then they never actually outright state what the villain's motive is per se, but these detectives pretty much state it. Uh, which is that every single day or building they go to is either in an abandoned area or some sort of slum. But every single one of those buildings they go to has a view of Tokyo. Uh, and they, they end up stating that basically... Because c- the final place they go to is the, the villain's uh, home. Like their childhood home. Uh, which has all been le- all but left in a state of disrepair and just completely ignored. Everything about it, Everything around it was barren too. There was nothing. Uh, and they go over the po- the the point is that basically the villain's entire m o is uh he he is essentially rebelling against this concept of of Tokyo as they knew it, which was about this constant sort of tearing down uh, of, of real estate tearing down of land and rebuilding on new reclaimed land over and over and over as a means of uh keeping things going and propping up their economy to the point where even the the big arc that we keep mentioning is this large bit of land created in the middle of the ocean to add these mega structures to purely for the sake of the economy. And it's supposed to be this new boom, like bustling place and all that. Uh, and it's also where all of the mechs are that are going berserk. Now, because it is such a big construction project, they needed so many mechs. And so this person basically planted a, a poison pill in the OS so that whenever uh, certain sounds reached the mechs, they would start going berserk. Uh, and so they do, because we don't get there. So basically what happens is the the main characters realize they need to destroy the Ark to save Tokyo. Because it's either they leave this mega structure alone and these, these mechs would go completely apeshit, or they sink the entire thing with the mechs on it. Uh, and so they decide to sink the entire thing, which is really great because that is billions upon billions of dollars down the fucking drain, but good riddance. Again, th- there's a reason they aren't the popular division. They are not the popular division by any means. Yep. Also, to be fair, they also sink the Ark under everybody's noses. Because they have no time to do it. Because uh, the mechs, once they, they got outside after a certain amount of time, and they heard the whistling of uh, the wind through buildings, which is a very specific noise, apparently, uh, they, they would go apeshit. Also, only when a a the wind speed becomes forty meters per second. I yes. thought that was just the full it, it needing forty meters per second was stated as like a floor, not necessarily the specific, exact specific. Well, it is, but also it requires that which you only get in a typhoon. Which, are, granted, typhoons are common, but also that's also reliant on. It's not like. When the wind hits, like, I don't know, like enough that maybe just a windy day would cause it. To be fair, that, that's on purpose, because once again, they need a trigger that is not too easily uh, flipped. But also, it's still really weird. Yes. Riddle me this, Batman! <laughs> so it's really great when they start sinking the entire arc in the middle of a typhoon, so everything goes to shit. As they sink only parts of it, and the mechs start going ape shit, including the sweet new police mech that uh, our our girl from the NYPD was using, and so it's just everything. It's it's all gone to shit, Koopa. Yes. But yeah. So at, at the end, the point is the villain is basically uh, their entire thing is the the just against the rapid development uh, and abandonment of of Tokyo. Uh, and they, they never fully state that outright, so I know some people in our group were really confused at the end, like, why they never, like, when they never said what exactly it was that the villain did, but yeah, that's that's it. One thing uh, that I thought was a useful clue to uh, arrive at that conclusion is the discussion you have between the guy who heads up the motor pool for the mobile police 
and the the engineer at Shinohara Heavy Industries talking about how they can't really keep up like they used to and they've got a bunch of experience but it's all dated so they're at that point sort of coasting on their reputations which makes them giant sized when viewed from a distance but if you get up close they're sort of breaking down and becoming corroded and faded um which i think is kind of a parallel to the way this guy both resented the massive skyscrapers that he could see from a distance wherever he lived but didn't actually get to live in as well as the notion that he was being forgotten on the periphery uh also to be fair the head mechanics response to that statement is also just straight up yeah i, I suck at the software shit but i'm still fucking bar none one of the best mechanics you'll ever meet <laughs> that's what matters yeah you have to you, you know you have to be able to get to be able to validate yourself in some ways otherwise apparently you go insane and invent a grandiose scheme to have eight thousand construction robots destroy tokyo which damn if that ain't a mood to be fair i feel like these like these the way that they react to everything i feel like they get cases to that extent like every quarter it seems like yeah it, i mean that's i mean that's the reason why that unit exists is for things just like that Again, they literally stopped a military coup. It's, it's important to note this fucking group stopped a military goddamn coup and people still hate them, which speaks volumes to how much hell they wreak. I mean, they they destroyed probably the equivalent of, what, 30 to 50 city blocks trying to stop a single runaway construction labor? Yep. Yeah. yeah. To be fair, that's, that's pretty normal with their labor crimes, too. Uh, because they they... they generally do not like firing live ammunition in the middle of the city because those are big fucking bullets. And that's yep. how we know this is not set in America. But yeah, so it, it, it's, 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 it's beautiful. But uh, also I, I, I do appreciate like everyone, like the people on the call and also the character's surprise when the villain wasn't where they thought he would be. He wasn't at the top of the tower like everyone thought he would be. No, he was fucking dead the entire time and it was just filled with birds that had yep. filtered in from all the rot and it's like kind of it's really good yep one thought i have that is somewhat orthogonal to the current discussion is i really appreciate that the film knew that there were two kinds of person who are coming for a pat labor movie there were people who were there for sort of the police procedural style of plot and for the pre-existing characters and whatnot. And then there were people who just wanted to see giant robots tear shit up. And they they teased you along with it a little bit at the very beginning. And then you had the you had the scene with the, uh, the police laborers being mobilized to stop the runaway Tyrant 2000. And then, and then at the end of the film, they went... Well, you've been very patient, and good children deserve a reward, and things go absolutely apeshit. Yeah, yeah like there is some really good robot gore in this movie, of especially once that uh, prototype robot comes in and just rips things apart, just with its spring-loaded head deleter. Yes. Also, uh, Ota just ripping the arm off one of the robots and just beating it to death with it is also always a good time. Rules yeah, I mean, also, nature. Noah's one-on-one -on -one fight with the prototype police unit at the very end is actually really good and really well done. Yep. And flows really well for what is essentially one woman and her, her kind of out-of-date mech and this giant fucking bleeding-edge mech that is operating purely off of programming. It's It's very good. It also returns again to that discussion they had at Shinohara Heavy Industries where they say it, it doesn't matter how advanced this stuff gets. Their, the core component that's always going to be the same is, is the people using it and making it. So if the people don't change, this stuff is not going to fundamentally change. And surprise, surprise, the bleeding edge labor that is running solely off its programming doesn't have a human element. And that proves to be a fatal flaw to be fair she ends up trashing her entire fucking mech in the process 
which is really good because they subtly implied that she fucking would early on in the movie when she's talking about how she named it all after all of her dead pets. Yep. <laughs> See, I always get that whole, the entirety of the whole, that always makes me interested about the whole, oh yeah, the man versus machine, man will always overcome it. It's like, no, no, we won't. We, there will come a point where we end up engineering something that is better than us and all of our, at something in all of our ways that we have no way of anticipating because so, someone's going to do a dumb thing to cut corners. To be fair, this isn't about that. <laughs> True. Uh, this is this is never about that, thankfully. But yeah, so I, I think it's a really good movie. There's a lot to it. There's a surprising amount of depth than would would expect. One would think from something like Pat Labor, which like. Pat like labor like Pat labor stuff has always been like some of it's really goofy, some of it's actually surprisingly in depth, like the whole once again military coup thing. But like this one actually, I think you can probably thank Mamoru Oshi for it more than anything. This has a lot of depth to it, and there's a lot that isn't outright explained, and you just kind of have to infer. Yeah. Uh, so, anyone have any last thoughts? Uh, not that I can think of. I think the. I think the scene where Noah and what's his face go a wall felt a little bit. It, I can I can see what how it was laying ground because, like Torpo mentioned, that's where we learned that all of Noah's pets had the same name, um, and it sort of sets up how they figure out why the range of effect on the subsonic frequencies is large enough to be an actual threat, but it feels a little bit like it was sort of justifying itself. I don't know exactly why they had to go AWOL to do that. Yeah, it did just kind of fuck off for a bit, and it was never really I, properly explained. In my I opinion. think it's more their personality kind of thing. Yeah, it was just the timing is weird of it. Yeah. But yeah, otherwise I think it's... it's... For all its flaws, it's 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 really fun. A lot of fun. Even if you don't pick up on everything, it's still fun. Yep. Also, you want to talk about how those fucking giant shotgun shells are loaded with fucking massive... Like, the huge, they will rip apart anything. So big. Yeah, I My mean... Not. I was going to say, there is... I forgot what the classification is. There are tank shells that are essentially buckshot that work on the same... Uh, principle, and I forgot what they're called, but they I do know they exist. It's great, because like me and Lola were like, those are slugs, aren't they? They're probably slugs. Uh, those nope. Are you can't see this else. fucking massive buckshot. Yeah, it's like, uh-huh. Okay, then. Uh, so the term for it is canister shot. But it is it is a... It's essentially using the same logic that cannons did with grape shot. Um, but there is like actual, um, there is a precedent for this kind of thing. I mean, there is, but there's fucking precedent for most kind of weapon you will ever think of. Davy Crockett. <laughs> I mean, don't forget the fucking breech loading 50 caliber handgun. Oh God. Yes. Well, that's just because gun people are. That's, Just, that's my point though is people always love stupid weapons and they will keep making them no matter how bad an idea they are so it's not shocking yes um it it's i don't i hate the fact that i was looking up tank buckshot and i just get to the actual um i don't google i don't want to download a brochure for from general dynamics for an actual ass thing of ammunition <laughs> for an Abrams tank. <laughs> Amazing. What the fuck? Good. But that is a main tank shell that is 120 millimeters. Yeah, 120 millimeters M1028 canister shot, which you load into the main goddamn gun of an Abrams tank which they have the cutout, that is a shit ton of buckshot in there. Jesus Christ. Yeah, when Google is not a priority, you just go for raw damage. And surely more bullet equals better than. Google, I wasn't talking phone. Don't, I'm not talking to you. God damn it, I hate Google. 
don't get don't don't get like Google Nest shit in your home. Just don't do it. Anyway. I think that's I think I think we've hit the point where I think we gotta rank this now. Google, please rank this movie. Yes. All right. Uh so we're gonna rank this using our normal one to twenty one scale. Uh, with one being absolute massacraft can't get any better, uh, to twenty one being uh, absolute garbage don't even bother watching, uh, not even fun ironically to watch. So Carnival, uh, what would you put this at? I, uh, hmm. I personally like this better than the early days, but the there are, I don't know whether or not the, uh, I don't want to call I'll say ambiguous ambiguous like nature of it is a thing to mark against it or not so i say two to three range though yeah i was gonna say it sounds more like it, that's a taste thing more than anything yeah that's yeah. what i said i wasn't sure was that a so i would say a two or three all right uh chachi this is a film that demands a fairly active watch um and like carnival hinted at if the if it doesn't really hit your tastes fairly squarely um you might have a little bit of a hard time following it so i feel like i would place it as as a four um even though i you know this is this is a this is a genre that i really quite like um it's sort of it's sort of a big thing for me um i feel like somebody who is not really steeped in in mecha media um might get left a little bit cold at times uh, it it sort of it it sort of depends. Like if you come at it as a more mature viewer who's watched a lot of cinema, I think you can tolerate some of the slow parts. Um, but I do still think that is kind of an obstacle. So so I would say like four probably. All right, uh, Torpo. Oh fuck me, goddamn. Um, see, I actually uh, so first off, I really really got into this. But like I can understand getting getting put off a bit by the uh, the, the more obtuse bits. Though I will say, like even if you don't get super into that, it's still a fun watch. You see Met go shoot and boom and punch thing, and it's kind of rad. Like even if you don't fully understand everything, in my opinion. Uh, also, I I'd say it's better than the early days. Uh, so I'd be willing to put it at a two or a one personally. All right. So your range is one to two. Mm-hmm. So. I actually was pretty much directly uh, aligned with Carnival on this. I was thinking two or three um, because um, if I were to say recommend, uh, and this is why I'm glad Chachi was here for this, because someone who is not familiar with Pat Labor, because I feel like that's a good um, kind of having a control person, someone who is not familiar with it as we are. Um Kind of in that vein, I feel like if you, you, the better Pat Labor, the thing that kind of envelops the entirety of Pat Labor, I feel like early days kind of is a better showing of it. Um, whereas Pat Labor, the movie is more like its story itself might be better and it's like production might be better. I actually kind of prefer the early days to the, and by, by prefer, I mean, like we're talking like minuscule preference of it. I think they're both fantastic um, pieces of media. I might slightly prefer early days more, um, but the movie is still pretty good. Um, so I do not think that if anything, I think it would be at a ceiling. I think it's probably at the same level. Um, that being said, going downward, um, Actually, speaking of Memorial Oshi stuff, I'm looking at three. Uh, we have Ghost in the Shell at three. Um, by the, actually, a, a major, like a lot of the same people, um, particularly uh, Oshi and uh, Kenji Kawai for music. Yeah, um, I, was, I was reviewing the list a little bit. I think I'm going to fake up slightly. I, I'd put it at a three. Like, I'm. I was. I was thinking. I was sort of trying to think in terms of somebody who is coming as a complete outsider to to the film. I, I've seen this movie before, and I do really like it. Um, I was sort of trying to think in context of somebody who was approaching it for the first time. 
Um, but looking at these rankings again, I think a three is more fair. Yeah, because I... Hmm. So I'm trying to think, what I... I do kind of feel like I do prefer this movie over Ghost in the Shell. Oh, like yeah, yeah. I would watch this over Ghost in the Shell. It's very much the same case where it's you're taking um, a pretty lengthy piece of media uh, that in trying to condense it into an hour and a half. Um, and I feel like this does a better job of it than Ghost in the Shell does. Um, also, I think this is just a better paced work than Ghost of the Shell is. Yeah, also also compared to something like Dirty Pair, uh, Proud Deed, which is also another really good movie. Uh, but Dirty Pair has some weird empty spots in that too. And I f- feel like this is just the better comprehensive package than I would say over Dirty Pair in Ghost in the Shell. And Rote El Dorado is also very, like, it's a kind of a different thing to compare to, but I still, I would say that this is a better movie than Rote El Dorado. Um, so I, f- I kind of actually feel like two is probably like if you were to say break two into if if half if half rankings were a thing, I would definitely say two and a half absolutely. Um, because there's some things that I would definitely prefer this movie over in two. Like, personally, I would rather watch this over Vampire Hunter D. Also, maybe even The Slayers. Um, also, also kind of Aliens, because this movie's an hour and a half instead of two. I know, it's a respectable length. I guess, yeah. it was nice. Because it was great, because I was thinking, I'm like, oh god, it's a Memorial Ocean movie, this movie's going to be like two and a half hours long. I'm like, no, it's an hour and a half. Um, and I was very surprised by that. Um... Is this another one we're going to end up putting the asterisks by of oops? We got no, uh, so the asterisks are for one or two, between one or two. I know that's what I was making a joke about. It's like, oh, are we doing another, adding another one to the we need to hammer out our one questions? I, I don't feel like this is a one. Yeah, like, neither do I. I just was joking. Oh, yeah. Um, it, it, there's just some, a lot, way too many weird things about it that I feel would keep it from one. Um, I'm kind of really thinking two. So I feel like it fits more in two than in three. Although. I will fucking fight against three, but otherwise. Yeah, like even though I said two or three, I feel two is the stronger case. Yeah, I'm I'm feeling more two-ish. I will fucking whip out a knife, so help me. I will cut somebody. Probably myself, but still. <laughs> Sighs as he draws his spring loaded head deleter. <laughs> it was a hand. It was a hand with sharp fingies. <laughs> yeah, I, I think in order to prevent this from becoming a picking like a weird specific match, let's uh I, I'm gonna go with majority and just say two. There you go. Good, I can put away the knife. We're all safe, but especially me. It's also great because it's like it's the kind of thing where it's like, oh, how proficient would be would you be with a knife? Okay, here's a ballpoint pen. Uh, take a look at your hand about thirty minutes after holding this thing, or trying to use this thing, and that's how well you'll do with a knife. Look, if I'm stabbing people, hoof easy. Slashing, bit harder. <laughs> There's a scar to prove that. God. And this was 1989, Memorial Oshi. This was a theatrical release. Uh, it is sci-fi. Uh, and it is anime as all hell. It is incredibly anime. Uh, is there anything, uh, nothing content-wise, uh, anything, let's see, musically, music slash audio, charm, uh, cinematography, storytelling, action, or art? Okay, so the animation's really good. It's definitely charming. And I actually also argue the music was pretty solid, too. The music was solid in my opinion, but I don't really had could really have a, like a standout piece that I remember from it. Honestly, to be fair, there doesn't need to be one in my opinion. But so it's it's a thing that because uh, Mamoru Oshii and Kenji Kawai go back a long way, uh, and he's done a lot of music for Mamoru Oshii's stuff. Um, 
it all really tends to be orchestral or not not orchestral uh more ambient than anything like especially if you think about like a majority of the soundtrack for say ghost in the shell um the thing with this compared to ghost in the shell is it doesn't have like the big like it doesn't have anything notable in it uh like it doesn't have like making of cyborg for example from ghost in the shell that uh chanting theme from the uh from ghost in the shell I, I do want to say the funny thing about this movie is that there are two musical stylings and then there, so basically there's the, the, uh, the, the style that's like more akin to ghost in the shell, which is sort of like the wooden instruments and all that, uh, that pretty much only plays when they're in the slums. And then otherwise it's that big, like not big orchestral stuff, but definitely more, a lot more orchestral shit to emphasize like the moments, especially with like a fighting going on and all that. It's very, it's very brazen. Um, a lot of a lot of brassy noises you get electric guitars at the at the climactic attack on the arc and stuff yeah god there's a lot of horn yep though i will agree animation and just background art in general is fantastic oh yeah it's it's great those are some really detailed slums (laughs) it is it is visually excellent excellent um which actually i kind of think that that you know, actually, I was about to put maybe a thumbs up for cinematography, but then there's that one scene in which um, Asma's getting suspended, and it goes in this really weird fisheye lens view for no reason whatsoever. And it's really weird looking when they're yelling back and forth at each other. Mm-hmm. It just, I don't know why they did that. It's actually kind of uncomfortable. I do um, want to say thumbs up to the writing, though, in my opinion. I thought it was pretty good. I think the characters are good. I don't know if the writing itself is good. I, don't, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the plot and the themes, and I enjoyed the characters a lot. But mm. it, I, the thing I would say about the the writing that kind of I wouldn't mark it down is I feel like um, uh, I f- I feel like. Uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, just the kind of ambiguity of it can kind of, that's very, like, as we were mentioning, kind of a taste thing uh, that some things aren't explained. But that could very much be a taste thing. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the ambiguity personally. Uh, I think I'm going to put a shrug. Just, just in the case, not necessarily that it's bad, but it's more, you. it's a thing that you may or may not like. Uh, also, that, hmm. I don't know if I want to give a thumbs up to action because there really kind of wasn't a whole lot of it, except for at the very end. Yeah, like the last 20 minutes were all action, but... The, the action that you did get, I feel, was was quite well executed. There was a sense of weight and momentum to the movements of the labors, even when they weren't destroying stuff. Um, there was a there was there was a lot of character to the individuals in how they moved as well um ota the guy who's super gung-ho the police the police brutality man he's he pilots his labor in a way that's very different than than the other characters he's much more willing to like just grind raw metal to throw himself around and and sort of wild out whereas other characters a little bit more tactical and cerebral um and you don't really ever have somebody tell you that sit down like this guy's a loose can and he's always causing problems they just they sort of go oh god this moron's gonna do it again and then boy he he got to do it this power squat is so good but uh yeah so i I will say like a lot of the stuff like uh, obviously dealing with the labors in in general is like pretty not a pretty standard, but like I, I, I do want to say, yeah, I agree with the weight. There's a lot of nice things about the weight, like the way the the weapons, even the guns move and feel. They have power. These are large, powerful objects, like the anti-material rifle, where which sent that thing airborne. That sent that car airborne. Which I'm pretty yes. sure that's not how that would work, but still, it looked really cool. Uh, and once again, like I cannot emphasize enough how good the final fight was between the the, the once again the the. Bleeding Edge, Mac, and and the normal. Yeah, you know what? I'm actually I'm gonna put a thumbs up for the action. Like, like even like the quick motion of like her grabbing the other Mac, popping open her cockpit to whip out her shotgun to try and shoot the neck. Oh, he'd immediately get swatted away. Was really fucking good. 
Yep. Um, it's, it's a good movie. Yep. Uh, anything for yay or nay? Can't really think of anything. No, not the time. Yeah, head. but I, I, I think sort of a nay for Asuma's voice acting. Um, I think it sort of comes down to a little bit of how they tried to translate to fit the flap dubbing, but um, he has really weird cadence and inflection at times, and it was sort of annoying at points. Yeah, I get you, but like he was just one among many. Yeah, I, I don't know if I'd put a whole name for that. Yeah, no, I, I don't have anything particularly big. For I don't really either. Nays. Yeah, my, same. My giant robots. Yay. Yep. Big Mech go bang. Ha ha, thingies go purr. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so that is going to do it then for Pat Labor the movie. Uh, so before we go, uh, Carnival, is there anything you want to plug? Uh, you can follow me at Toko underscore Carnival and uh, please donate to your local charity or bail fund. All right, uh, Chachi. Uh, I would like to plug a friend, uh, twitch.tv slash portable stove, as well as your local animal shelter. All right, Torpo. Twitch.tv slash Torpotypist and at Torpotypist on Twitter. And I would like to uh, plug... The, the 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 massive loss of funds from this entire endeavor. <laughs> All right. Um. So, uh, with that, um, our next episode, which might, depending on if I remember how the schedule works, um, not where I put out a um, actually the day we're recording this, so it actually doesn't really make a difference for you, the listener, um, but uh. I recently put up a video on my YouTube and also there should be a episode in the channel that basically went up instead of a Hazeltown story episode this week, uh, describing some, uh, content update, uh, for, um, basically this and also some of my other stuff that I do, um, to reiterate what that said here, um, media Delta is no longer going to be weekly. Uh, it is now going to be every other week. Um, so unless some things happen and, uh, I might have to change that, uh, depending upon that, uh, what should happen is, uh, media Delta is now, what's going to happen is media Delta is now going to be on Thursdays instead of Tuesdays. Uh, and basically it's going to alternate between media Delta and Hazeltown story. Uh, so just, if you had not seen that update, uh, that is something that is going out. Um, so, yeah, uh, next episode after this should be in two weeks. Uh, and it should be talking, concluding our uh, discussion of Moomin. Uh, so we'll be taking a look at uh, another seven episodes of Adventures from Moomin Valley, uh, which we enjoyed last time. So we'll see if we continue to enjoy it with seven more episodes. So with that, uh, that'll do it. So thank you all for listening. Hashtag fuck money. If you would like to look at the full list of rankings for yourself, please visit r3.ldp.life and go to the Media Delta List tab. If you would like to watch Media Delta's sister show, Retro Rank Rhapsody, you can either watch at youtube.ldp.life or by tuning into twitch.tv slash lodapuzzlo at 7.30 p.m. on Fridays, 2.30 p.m. on Saturdays, and 1 p.m. on Sundays. All those times are from the Eastern U.S. time zone. If you would like to discuss this episode with the community, you can do so by joining our Discord server, which you can do so by go going to discord.ldp.life. Thank you again for listening, and I hope you tune in for our next episode.